Good morning to everyone and welcome to this year's Patient Organization Networking Day. So my name is Kill Hansen. I'm the chair of ELF and I'm also an asthma patient from Denmark. Yes, good morning. And my name is Michaela Udmir, and I'm chair of Health Patient Advisory Committee and president of the Swedish Asthma and Allergy Association. It is our pleasure to have you here with us today. We have representatives from patient organizations, individual patients, healthcare professionals joining from all over the world. Quite amazing. Kjell, over to you. It's fantastic. That's what it is. So I would like to take a moment then to thank our planning group who helped to put today's event together. So I think it's important to note that ELF is a patient-led organization with a patient-driven agenda and we are nothing without our patients and contributors. So thank you to Mikaela Odemur, my co-host from the Swedish Asthma and Allergy Association. Thank you to Liam Galvin from the EU IPFF Thank you to Hilde de Kaiser from CF Europe. Thanks Stefano Pavanello from Union of Lung Transplant Patients in Padua. Thank you to Lilia Belenko Jendetz from FFAR. Thanks to Sarah O'Connor from Asthma Society of uh, Ireland. Thank you to Stanislav Kors from uh, Czech Civic Society Against Lung Disease. And finally, a big thanks to Gergely Messeros from Pul Pulmonary uh, Hypertension Association Europe. So we are looking forward to a day of discussions, of sharing experiences. We encourage you to engage and to, uh, to be interactive in the chat. Do say hello, tell us where you're from and how you are. We have a question and answer session after each uh, group of speakers. And then you can put together questions, put them into the chat, and we will try to pick out as many as possible. Just for the record, there are no stupid questions. So Michaela and I will try to uh, put as many questions through as possible during the Q&A session. So now I'll hand you over to Michaela for some housekeeping rules. Thank you, Shell. Well, the meeting style event is to encourage discussion. So everyone has the ability to speak and to share the video. And we ask everyone stays on mute because otherwise we will hear the back sound noise. Um, and of course, unless you're invited to speak. And for example, during the Q&A session, you can choose whether you want to share your video or not. And this event will be recorded and talks will be uh, available on uh, ELF website after this event, so others can freely access them. And we will also, of course send on the link. And the, the ELF team are on hand for any technical support. Just pop a message in the chat or email, email them at info at europeanlung.org. And get involved through the chat and through social media Please tag ELF in your post and uh, the event page has full details of today's program, including the speakers. We will keep the Zoom room open during the breaks for networking. If you just want to chat or yeah, look at the questions uh, that are in the chat and pulling, there will be uh, several pools that we will be asking you to participate in. So I think we will start with one now. What are the drink of the day of what that you had this morning? I wait a bit. I see it's over eighty percent who has answered. Do I end the poll or do we wait? We have 90%. Was it, so, so we, yeah, as you can see, uh, there are coffee 
is obviously the most popular choice. And uh, I must agree on that. I already had three cups this morning. I started at six o'clock this morning. I will now hand over to Shell to introduce uh, our theme of the day. Thank you, Michaela. So I'm also a part of the silent majority, also a coffee drinker here. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to the session on self-management. Our focus today uh, is self-management. It's something that's more prevalent and something that many patients have to decide upon whether they want to engage with or not. So as someone living with a long disease, I know that's important and the efforts and activities that the patients undertake each day to manage their health and well-being is vital to keep uh, and manage and maintain a good quality of life. So it's something I do my, myself as well. Uh, patient organizations, they play an important role alongside healthcare professionals in supporting people with long-term conditions to self-manage their disease. I'm super excited to listen to all the presentations uh, that we are lined up today on this topic and to hear from patients, organizations across Europe who are working closely with their patient communities to provide tailored self-management support. So later in the day, there'll be a chance to share your own experience during our breakout discussion groups and also to identify future areas for advocacy and for support. And we also know that some patients who don't like to engage in uh, self-management, and I think that's also an important issue to uh, discuss. So finally, I would signpost to you uh, the patient organization uh, posters and videos that showcase a lot of variety of self-management activities happening across Europe and beyond. And you will see already then uh, some examples on this slide. But to get us started, we'll have a quick poll to understand what experience uh, attendees have around self-management. So there are three questions. Uh, so you might need to scroll down uh, on your screen to see them all. So please engage with the poll. So we are. Uh... I'm not able to get mine on submit. Oh, I I've just put in the answer, but when I go to submit it, it doesn't seem to be coming up. Okay, I understand. Okay. No worries. Okay. I'll just go. Okay. So we are past the eighty percent mark. So fifth, yeah. So yeah. So we we have more than eighty percent participating in the poll. Uh, so the first question is, how much to do uh, do you know about the work of the European Lung Foundation? So quite equal between I know a lot about ELF and I know little about ELF, and a few of you know very little about ELF, and also I know nothing about ELF. So hopefully we can uh, start to enlighten you on the work that we do here uh, today. Second question is how informed do you feel about self-management for lung diseases? And there's also a quite even distribution. There's around 50% that feels quite well informed, but uh, there's around 25% that uh, feels either very well informed or quite uninformed. Uh, and also a few on very uninformed. And for the final question, mm -hmm. how confident are you in sharing your knowledge about self-management in your with your patient community? Then also a quite even distribution. Most are on quite confidence, 45%, while equal distribution between very confident and not confident. So we'll see what we can do about that in the course of the day. 
thank you all for putting uh, your your answers in the chat box or attempting to put the answers in your chat box. I hope we can solve this technical problem as we move along. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce the first two speakers of the day. So we have Professor Marc Humbert, who is a specialist in rare lung disease based in Paris, France. And he runs a large research laboratory focusing on pulmonary hypertension. Marc is the current president of the European Respiratory Society. Along him, we also have Professor Carlos Robalo Cordero. Cordero, uh, and he is a lung specialist working in Com Compra in uh, Portugal. His main field of interest is in the testial lung diseases, and Carlos is the president-elect of the European Respiratory Society, and he will uh, take over from Mark in the upcoming EIS Congress in Barcelona. So welcome to you both, and we are so pleased and honored to uh, have you here. Mark. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kiel, uh, Michaela. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you today, and it's a great satisfaction to see so many faces in front of me right now. I feel a little bit, um, I feel a little bit embarrassed because I see all these, all these faces watching me. But it's really good to see you, and I would like also to uh, to thank warmly Pippa and the people in the office who work so closely with you and with such a successful, um, uh, successful um, series of. Uh, of successes. So uh, I know uh, from last year that time flies very fast. I mean, a year ago, I was with Anita um, Simons, uh, uh, welcoming you and participating to your to your event. And you asked me what will be my priorities for the year. So uh, I did not foresee all the difficulties we would have huh? this year, ranging from uh, you know uh, COVID war relationship with. Uh, um, with tobacco companies, etc. So we had so many uh, problems, but I told you I'm a positive thinker and uh, my priority would be on uh, partnership with you guys and also focusing on rare uh, lung diseases because it is my, um, my major strength in the field. So I would like first to highlight the many achievements of European Lung Foundation and uh, your uh, work has been really highly visible uh, you are really working very hard and uh, you are extremely su successful in all your capacities. Uh, I really look forward to a great day. I think the theme of the day is a major one. Uh, as, a, as a physician, I mean, self-management, it's my business every day. Uh, patient uh, empowerment, uh, carers' involvement. Uh, really, uh, we we need to to be uh, together to uh, best partner, uh, offer the best possible education, have nurses, healthcare professional, patients, expert patients around the table. So I'm sure you are going to discuss all that. And um, as uh, head of uh, uh, referral center for rare lung diseases, I can tell you that education and self-management it's top of the list uh, it's really super important so well done with your highlight of the day so last year uh, you asked me uh, my priorities and uh, i would like now before handing over to carlos to my friend carlos uh, i would like to tell you uh, what uh, has been performed in the last year as achievements uh, according to uh, to my priorities of last year so first achievement very strong partnership with patients and uh, doctors and uh, and pharma and respiratory societies the international respiratory coalition obviously uh, we we did the first uh, international respiratory coalition um, summit in paris at the end of last june uh, the respiratory societies were present the patients were uh, dominant i would say i mean you were many and uh, your voice was very, very well uh, heard. So for the people who don't know really what is International Respiratory Coalition, it's a new coalition uh, aiming to offer each individual country all the tools and instruments to promote respiratory health at a national level. And uh, you will see in, uh, in Barcelona, either on site or online, we are going to uh, revive 
the white book. You know, the white book, it's information about uh, lung diseases, but it will be a, a new vision of the white book, which will be called Lung Facts. It will be online. It will be launched next Sunday. No, uh, and um, this Sunday, in fact, and uh, it will be, I think, extremely important for your uh, all your all the work you do uh, for your uh, community. So, um, self management, of course, will be a priority in the national plans. The second uh, thing I would like to highlight after the International Respiratory Coalition is all the work I did in close partnership with uh, one of you, uh, Gergely Mesaros from uh, PHA Europe. Uh, you already uh, greeted uh, Gergely. Uh, we did uh, two important things together, together also with ELF and with the Brussels office, uh, Paulina and Brian. We did a call to action and uh, PHA uh, Europe has been uh, uh, instrumental in uh, building this call to action. Uh, we had uh, two MEPs, including a, a Hungarian uh, MEP who was very friendly with us and Gergely especially. And um, in Brussels, with ERS, with ELF, with PHA, we launched the call to action. And believe me uh, or not, this call to action was so professional that it was highlighted in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine with a dedicated article on it. And uh, I can tell you this was something and well done uh, to all the uh, patient association to be able to do something like that. And the final thing before handing over to Carlos is uh, another uh, action we had together with patients, it is a pulmonary hypertension guidelines. So pulmonary hypertension guidelines have been launched uh, last Friday in Barcelona at the European Society of Cardiology. Uh, it will be relaunched uh, this week at the European Respiratory Society. Uh, it is a joint guideline with uh, European Society of Cardiology, European Respiratory Society. It is endorsed by the European Reference Network on rare lung diseases, ER and lung, and it is also endorsed by the International Society of Art and Lung Transplantation. It is, I must say, a masterpiece. I mean, it is a very, very beautiful document, very long, very detailed, very good in terms of methodology. But the very important thing is that the patients are part of it. And uh, both Gergely Messaros and Pisana Ferrari are both uh, authors, not only members, but authors of the guidelines. And um, in Barcelona uh, la uh, last uh, Sunday, uh, we had Pisana on stage. And in Barcelona this Sunday, we will have Gergely on stage. So uh, beautiful uh, visibility of patients, thanks to ELF and ERS for, for that. And merci, thank you, uh, Gergely, for uh, all your activities with uh, PHA Europe. Of course, uh, I'm biased in terms of uh, uh, conditions. So I mentioned pulmonary hypertension. In fact, rare diseases by definition are less visible than common diseases. And I took the privilege to be president of the ERS to put pulmonary hypertension in the spotlight. But of course, I'm thinking every day about you know, asthma, COPD, interstitial lung disease, uh, cystic fibrosis, et cetera. It's uh, bronchiectasis. You, you have achieved incredible things uh, with ELF, and uh, you will always count on me uh, to, to help you. Some of you may know uh, my next uh, step uh, in France is to uh, uh, put together the French network on rare lung disease. We have 87 centers throughout France, and France is very strong in rare disease. This is a 2022 duty. Mm -hmm. And in 2023, we will have to uh, relabel the European Reference Network, ERN Lung. And I really count on you, ELF and ERS, uh, to be uh, very, very strong partners in the application that we'll put together. So uh, I spoke enough, I, I think. Uh, so I thank you again. I wish you a beautiful day, uh, self-management, fantastic priority. And now I hand over to, uh, to Carlos, who is uh, a good friend and a fantastic partner at ERS level. So Carlos, uh, uh, it's your turn. Thanks. Thank you, Mark, for the excellent introduction. Uh, and now I will follow you uh, after this uh, outstanding year with your presidency. So first of all, I would like to congratulate Help for the, for the, the work that has been done and for the several achievements that uh, recently were recently obtained. We listened to that 
yesterday and that's for the sake of respiratory patients. So congratulations. And I would like to thank Pippa, Kel, the Mikel, and all of you for the, the invitation to be here and, and to keep this address together with Mark. I think it's important to be together, the, 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 the actual president and the next president. We could be this express uh, not only a smooth transition that we, we wish, but also the, the, the continuing support to ELF and uh, of course the patient needs. So uh, um, first of all, in during the, the, the next year, the year of my uh, ERS uh, uh, presidency, I, I would like to continue the excellent work that, is, that has been, been done and uh, Mark uh, stressed, uh, I think, uh, uh, very important flagships. One of these is the International Respiratory Coalition. This is something to be developed. This is still a baby. Uh, and so a baby has to be uh, developed uh, with careful. Uh, and uh, of course, this is one of my main aims. The other is uh, the European Respiratory Channel that we are now promoting. And during this year, it will be developed. We will create a team, a, a professional team and this is something that I would call a kind of lung flicks that we want to promote in our website and, of course, where ELF will have a place. And so not only for the IRC, the International Respiratory Coalition, but also for the, the, the ERS Respiratory Channel, of course, ELF will be uh, on board. I, I'm also focused, and I think it will be important for next year, on environmental issues, on climate changes and uh, respiratory health. I think those can be important uh, topics to be promoting during uh, next year, together with the, with, the, with the prevention and promotion of lung health. Uh, this is something that is important now. I think we are uh, in the agenda. Uh, climate change and then respiratory health is in the agenda. So I think we have to take that uh, advantage. And, and I'm very keen, for instance, with the, with, with the program that will be activated in schools. From Barcelona, from Barcelona on, I think uh, I, I'm really looking forward for uh, seeing how it uh, happen in Barcelona because it is something to be uh, developed. Well, I, I work mainly, uh, as you said, Keld, on, on, on interstitial lung diseases. And uh, tomorrow it will start the pulmonary fibrosis month. So I, I think it, together with the RS Assembly 12, uh, the Assembly of Interstitial Lung Disease and the the, the, the head and the secretary are very are willing to to work and collaborate with with us and the, with the leadership and with the patients and together also with the, the European Pulmonary Fibrosis Federation uh, we wish to promote the, the the visibility of pulmonary fibrosis during this month and the, the hashtag PF uh, months uh, and also to take this opportunity to promote all over the year the self-management as Mark very well uh, underlined and, and the, the empowerment of patients with the, with the interstitial uh, lung diseases. This is something that, of course, I will, uh, it is one of my uh, aims as uh, working mainly on interstitial lung disease. But uh, uh, it was already mentioned by, by, by Mark, uh, the most important is to continue to have, to have health together, working together with DRS. Uh, everywhere, in our, in, our, in our our committees, in our advocacy committees, in our executive committees. So everywhere you have a place in the voice uh, everywhere. And I think it will, it, it has to continue to be uh, like that. So briefly, uh, this is the main vision for the, the next year. And I, I would like to thank you again for the invitation. And I will be very happy continue to continue to work with all of you. Thank you, uh, Kelden, Magella. Thank you so much, uh, both to Mark and, and to Carla. So I think we are extremely fortunate to have uh, such strong support from you and so so large an engagement in uh, what we do. And I really look forward to uh, to working with you. Of course, uh, both Carlos and Mark are long term friends and collaborators of ELF, and we really look forward to take that to the next level with you, Carlos, in the, in the coming year. So thank you so much for your contribution and for joining us today. I think it's very important to have you both here and uh, to interact with uh, our whole community. So we are very pleased with that. And now I want to hand over to uh, Michaela uh, to take us forward. Thank you. And thank you, Mark and uh, Carlos. 
We will now move on to our keynote session. And I am so delighted to introduce to you our two keynote speakers, Dr. Tanya Ething. She is an epidemiologist with a background in physiotherapy and in expert in self-management in people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Uh, she is uh, affiliated with the University of Adelaide and Finders University in Adelaide, Australia. And Ian is a cystic fibrosis patient and father of one from Israel. He is vice chairman of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation of Israel uh, in a change of access of label and clinical trials recruitment. In his professional life, Ian has been a career in the software industry in various architecture and CTO roles. There will be a question and answer session following both presentations. So please put your question to Tanya and Ian in the set. So Tanya, over to you. Thank you for the introduction. I will share my presentation. All right, uh, just, okay. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, I'm going to present about self-management in people with chronic lung disease. And I'm going to talk um, about the theory from theory to implementation. So today, um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit about definition, then the theory about behavioral change, research, and implementation. I just try to reduce this. Yeah, that's better. Okay, first, the definition. Um, I first want to be clear about if we talk about self management, we talk about the behavior of the individual. And the self management intervention is the treatment and intervention and is defined by LORIC in 2003 as a structured intervention for individuals aimed at improvement in self-help behaviors and self-management skills. The intervention is aimed at problem solving, decision-making, resource utilization, formatting patient-provided partnerships, and action planning and self-tailoring. Um, we did an, with a COPD self-management expert group, we have reached consensus about what should be in a self-management intervention. And I think that can be generalized to other uh, respiratory diseases too. First of all, it needs to be multi-component. And you can think about co components as exacerbation management, dyspnea management, anxiety and depression, and phys uh, physical activity. It should be structured and personalized. And because the intervention is aimed at behavioral change, behavioral change techniques should be included. And it needs to be iterative, and there needs to be a process between a patient and a healthcare provider. So it means a once-off intervention is not seen as a self-management intervention, and support, support of healthcare providers is really important. Then we move towards theories, changing behavior. Changing behavior is more than just saying to patients that they have to change behavior. It's a far more delicate process, and um, I think this is really helpful in understanding that not all patients are ready to take action or to change their behavior yet. If people are in a pre-contemplation phase, they are unaware of the problem. And um, the intervention should be directed towards creating awareness and changing values and belief. In the contemplation phase, People are aware of the problem and the desired behavioral change, they, but they are still not ready to act. You have to persuade and motivate. In the preparation phase, they are ready to uh, take action. And this is the time that you can, can start with self-management inter interventions and action plans. In the action phase, they practice the desired behavior and you should faci facilitate the action. And in the maintenance phase, they work to sustain the behavior and you should reinforce the changes. So uh, what I really like to underline here is that not all patients are ready to change a particular behavior. And sometimes you have to work towards that preparation phase. So 
So changing behavior is learning and increasing new behavior and unlearning reducing existing behavior. For example, if you want to be more active, you have to reuse your sedentary behavior. So changing aspects of behavior, if, an, uh, if a behavior is um, already there, you can change, for example, aspects as frequency, intensity, speed, and form. Um, I can't go into a lot of detail in 15 minutes, so I thought that I, I would really like to recommend this book if you are uh, interested in changing behavior. It's easy to read. It's a book from Paul Chance, and it's not only directed towards behavior of kids, as the cover almost uh, shows, but it's uh, changing um, behavior of adults uh, in, well, people in all age brackets. Um, so if we talk about self-management interventions, as I said before, behavioral change techniques should be included. The group of Michi and all, you might have heard of them. Uh, they have put a really nice taxonomy together in which they have defined 93 behavioral change techniques clustered in 16 categories. And they have designed an app that is super helpful to learn about, specify and interpret behavioral change techniques. You see a, a, a screenshot of the app here, and you see eight of the 16 categories. And each category has multiple behavioral change techniques. And for each behavioral change technique, it's defined what it is. And examples are given about how you can use it. There's an online training linked to the app. Um, but it's not necessary. And you can use the app without the online training. And both the app and the training are free. So if you want to learn more about how to change behavior, you could look at the app and the online course. You could uh, look at the book that I just recommended. If you have, want to have a more academic approach, you could um, read the book of David Bestbrook regarding an introduction in cognitive behavioral therapy. But if you are a healthcare provider that is involved in self-management interventions, I would highly recommend to do at least a motivational interviewing course. And the step after that would be cognitive behavioral therapy courses. Let me move towards research. I won't go in too much detail, but I thought it needed to be part of this presentation. So this slide shows the self-management uh, self intervention publications over time. And you see that the pub publications of asthma were far uh, earlier published than those for, of, for example, bronchiectasis. And of course, the period of time in which publications have happened influences uh, the number of publications that are there at this point in time. Um, but not, not, not alone that um, influences the total body of evidence, because um, you can see uh, quite a difference between the number of publications of COPD and cystic fibrosis. And as you know, there are far more people with COPD than with cystic fibrosis, and um, there is uh, quite a bit more money to do research uh, for COPD. So almost that is driving the publications. and. Um, I think that's really good to realize if in the end you look at reviews. Because in uh, literature reviews, randomized controlled trials can be included. And randomized controlled trials are the studies in which you compare groups of people. And for example, if you would have two groups of people, one group of people could receive the uh, self-management intervention, and one group of people would have no self-management intervention. And you would compare those groups of people over time and could look at health uh, at outcomes as, for example, healthcare use and quality of life. And that would give you an idea about the effect of the intervention, in this case, the self-management intervention. In literature review, we extract information from those randomized controlled trials, and that gives us effect sizes of, for example, healthcare use and quality of life, and we know whether the intervention works or not. However, if you look at the latest self-management intervention reviews, you see, for example, that for cystic fibrosis, only three, four RCTs could be included. So four randomized controlled trials. And that were three trials in uh, children and one uh, trial in adults. And that was not, not enough to say 
something about effectivity. So the effectivity in cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis is still unclear. However, for example, in asthma and COPD, it's clear that uh, self-management interventions work and are effective in reducing healthcare use. More studies are, our, are however needed to define the most effective intervention components. We are still not completely uh, clear what we need to include in CPD self-management programs, uh, so, sorry, self-management programs. Um, the modus, the duration and frequency and uh, the behavioral change techniques. Then we go towards implementation. Of course, for implementation and adherence, the patient is central. Um, however, uh, the healthcare provider, there needs to be um, training for the healthcare provider. The healthcare provider's knowledge needs to be up to date, but also the, the healthcare provider needs to have um, a preference to do the self-treatment self intervention. If the, the healthcare provider is not positive in doing self-treatment, it's probably the, uh, the wrong person at the wrong place. There are, uh, there might be organizational issues. Um, 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 Self-management interventions are often uh, multidisciplinary and organizations have to work together. And that needs, that needs also be in place to uh, get an, a successful implementation of the intervention. Uh, the, the role and support of uh, the family, the carers, the parents is really important. The community comes, um, needs to be supportive and there might be some cultural issues. Um, this is a study in chronic disease self-management interventions in older adults. And they looked at barriers and facilitators for self-management interventions. And they defined that barriers are physical health, perverse cognitive health, financial difficulties, low self-regulation and low health literacy. Healthcare barriers was mistrust between the patient and the healthcare provider, inadequate time of the healthcare provider, and a focus on a single disease in people who might have multiple diseases. Cultural barriers were the traditional uh, role expectation and a preference for folk medicine. Facilitators for adherence to self-management interventions was support, support of family, community, and community nurses. Um, what I have done here is that I have looked at the most recent um, uh, quite a couple of uh, recent publications within respiratory disease and look what kind of barriers were described in there. And that was mental health was a barrier, diff difficulties with symptom recognition, time and time management, uh, the um, reducing parental supervision in cystic fibrosis when, uh, when they caught at the teenage years, lack of access to support, Lack of resources, that was a thing in bronchiectasis because most of the resources were directed towards COPD. Complexity of regimens in case regimens were directed towards multiple diseases. And uh, facilitators with positive beliefs and satisfaction towards the intervention of patients and healthcare providers. The patient ability and motivation. Parent involvement, especially in uh, self-management interventions in school for asthma, uh, uh, chil uh, children with asthma. Support again, so that's a really important thing to support professional, peer, carer and psychosocial. Healthcare providers knowledge and understanding of the disease, again the training of the healthcare providers and that's the next point too. They need to have communication skills to establish a patient-centered approach. So this is a whole pool of barriers and facilitators, and there are many more if you look at the individuals. So to optimize implementation of and adherence to self-management interventions, it is really important to discuss potential barriers and to try to put strategies in place before you start with the self-management intervention. 
To use evidence-based interventions and healthcare provider support is crucial in that. To train healthcare providers in the shared decision-making and, the, and the use of behavioral change techniques. To check whether patients are ready to change a particular behavior. And you could do that with the stages of behavioral change. To tailor an intervention to the individual's needs and preferences. And this is really important uh, for adherence. And in general, to use shared decision-making. I think my 50 minutes are done and I would like to thank you for your, um, for your attention. And I also put a poll question. Um, I'm not completely sure how this works. I probably have to stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Tanya. It was so interesting. And uh, the question, yeah, we have the poll first. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yes. Shall I say what the question is? What is, according yes. to you, the most important barrier for individuals to adhere to a self-management intervention? And there are 10 options. Accessibility of interventions, complexity of interventions, lack of social support, lack of professional support, interventions focuses too much on a single disease, individual, individual time management, individual uh, health literacy, and I thought there was an other, but we don't have that option. Yes, Tanya, Probably if you not. scroll down, so there's also individuals, physical health, individuals, oh, mental yeah. health, and others. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So there are the 10 options. Yeah, and you see that the individual's health literacy is already also um, the lack of professional support. I would have had expected that one, but the individual's health literacy is a really important point. And I only had 15 minutes, so I couldn't go into detail into that. Otherwise, that would have been one of the things I would have loved to highlight more, uh, that self-management interventions need to be tailored towards uh, the individual's health literacy. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, like I said in the beginning, the question we will take after Ian has had his presentation, but please put them in the chat. I saw some come, but please continue. And now Ian will talk from a patient perspective on self-management. Please, the floor is yours, Ian. Hello, let me just share. If you can hear me do this. Yes. All right, great. Um... Okay. So perfect. Now we can see. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm going to run very quickly on this, but just a little introduction. Uh, so I remember when I tried to explain things to my coworkers about genetics, etc. I asked them, you know. What do you think about this uh, green icon? Who's the, who's the exception here? So my whole family are actually filled with doctors and, and uh, civil engineers, and I'm the black sheep uh, or the green sheep uh, in, in this situation, uh, where A, I'm, I, I'm, I'm an architect, but not for buildings, uh, actually for high tech which for them is probably something uh, almost disgraceful. And the other thing is that I, have, I am the only one of the, all of the carriers that exist in my family, which actually carry two mutations uh, of uh, cystic fibrosis. Um, I, have to, I have to say, I'm not going to go into too deep uh, of what CF is because I want you, I probably you all know uh, about it quite a lot, but, here is an example of a, of a, of a, of, a, of a, one of the types of mutations CF has a stop codon uh, mutation where the uh, the the stop uh, signal is basically displaced and placed in the wrong place, 
And because of that, the CFTR uh, protein uh, um, isn't completed. It's not functional. There are other types of mutations. Some are, uh, are uh, causing either instability. Some are causing less effecti effective uh, uh, <clears throat> chloride channels. But in the end of the day, we all suffer from uh, chloride channels not being uh, functional. And that creates a lack of uh, transference of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, chloride, salt, et cetera. And, uh, and in the end of the day, at least for the lungs, uh, which you know, CF is a multi-organ uh, organ progressive genetic disease, but at least we're, we're gonna talk about the lungs. It creates a very problematic and thick mucus, and that creates a great place for bacteria to grow and a lot of da progressive damages uh, along the year. Uh, I should have had this animation uh, while I was talking, but let's just skip to something a bit different. Um, how does a day-to-day -day of a CFR look like from the you know, perspective of treatment? Um, so it's a long list and I'm not using animation animation of one by one, just so you can capture it, right? So seasonal means that if I have an exacerbation or, or a reason to have IV, I would take it uh, in the morning. Then if I can do my morning physiotherapy, meaning lung clearance, secretion clearance, uh, if possible, I'll do the 9% hypertonic saline uh, inhalation before the lung clearance. Uh, another inhalation in the morning for antibiotics, which has to be separated in for at least 30 minutes or 20 minutes from the first uh, 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 for the prior inhalation because it kind of interacts. There's an afternoon IV. You do your sports. I do my swimming and uh, beach volleyball uh, usually. Pulmozyme, which softens the secretions uh, by destroying the, by destroying the some of the DNA there. Um, after the sport itself, you try to do more physiotherapy because then your lungs are very, very clear and open. And another inhalation for antibiotics, another IV in the evening or at night because it's eight uh, hours apart, and pills, uh, you know, lots of lots of pills for different reasons. And why am I giving you this? Is uh, we're not, I'm not trying to to create some uh, uh, sympathetic uh, feeling. This is the day, this is how it looks like. And just imagine how important it is to be more flexible with time, not to be dependent on others, not to go to clinic as, as much as you can uh, uh, to open that up. And during the years, uh, there was uh, another uh, kind of disruption and then came this little guy. And you can imagine that uh, that changed uh, uh, quite a lot in my uh, dependencies and day in CF. A lot relates to dependencies. You can't do what you want when you want it. There's a lot of dependencies between the different phases of, uh, of the day, uh, and it's definitely an issue. So what do I use for uh, home metering? Or, and again, this is just my ex uh, experience. It doesn't mean that uh, there is no better or more uh, standard way of doing that. Uh, so there's a survey app, and we'll talk about it later, uh, that, that the hospital makes me fill all these surveys, and I'm generally very uh, compliant and a lot of adherence in the CF community, but uh, uh, it's still challenging. Uh, for lung clearance, uh, besides the physical therapist, I actually use some home uh, system, which is called the cough assist, which is actually brought over from, from other diseases, but it creates uh, quite a lot of, uh, 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 it reduces the dependency on somebody uh, helping you with physiotherapy because uh, it, mainly when you have this device for insufflation and insufflation, uh, without straining your, your uh, straining at all, uh, you, your lungs and airways become less narrowed. Uh, also, we have some other uh, standard uh, devices like uh, BPAP and, uh, and uh, negative pressure from PPAP, but, but that specific uh, machine is, uh, is quite uh, good. Uh, I have a home spirometer where in, uh, in CF, we mainly, uh, uh, we mainly look at FEV1 
as the main uh, as the main uh, uh, metering uh, uh, metric. Sorry. Also, of course, uh, uh, for more urgent uh, urgencies. Uh, uh, events, uh, uh, saturation measure, the SpO2. Um, we started off uh, around a year ago, uh, a year and a half because of COVID mainly, to also use some remote stethoscope uh, where, uh, you know, in the end of the day, you have to get to your physician, but it does give some uh, some additional dimension to do it uh, at home. It also have other sensors like camera for the ears and nose, but mainly it's a remote stethoscope uh, by Taito. It's, a, it's something that uh, you probably know. Uh, an activity watch mainly attracts uh, my day-to-day uh, -day swimming, volleyball, walking. Uh, I think the main thing is, uh, is heart rate uh, and tracking uh, maybe a bit of, a, of my sleep activity. Uh, other other metrics there, I can't really say they're really uh, efficient. And uh, an inhalation device, which is not different from what you know, I don't feel it's a home treatment, but it is done something because it's mobile with batteries and it's very quick. It does give you a lot of flexibility during the day. Um, so um, from my perspective, uh, what are the pros and cons that we and risks we need to look at? So on the advantages side, uh, you know, of course, less, uh, uh, much less busy, a very busy day with much less burden, where you have to get to uh, 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 the hospital or depended on the time that your physiotherapist will come over. Um, uh, the order of things, as I said, it's. It's very. It's a very complex disease. Things are dependent on, on another, and then you have to wait an hour between something else. When you own everything and you control everything, uh, it creates a lot of efficiency and better treatment in the end of the day. Uh, I, unless you have a, a, a personal aid, which gives you a, a full day uh, calendar, it's just something that you want to be flexible with. Cross-infection. Uh, so that's one of the main risks in, in CFs uh, uh, that you get the bacteria either from the hospital or from another CFR with uh, a bacteria which is already uh, resistant. Uh, so it produces this risk uh, uh, dramatically, and uh, and tracking your health abroad. You know we we we're not tied down to to our uh, country. We do go to either uh, uh, vacations or or. Home, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, work uh, related, uh, and and tracking where you are at, at, at uh, in, in uh, abroad is something that uh, is it's very useful. In regarding to to the cons or risks, uh, you know, anxiety and obsessiveness obsessiveness is is something that has a real factor in 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 a, in a chronic disease. Uh, you you know it's all about numbers, right? Your FEV one, you always track your FEV one, and you're, you when you have a low FEV one, you start thinking, oh no, I need to I need to do this and that. And once you go swimming and you already have a feeling that your FEV one is going to drop next week in the test, you already start thinking about what you're gonna do and the goals, etc. That that overthinking, to be honest, it's not really overthinking. It's a it's a it's a, it's a demonstration. Of uh, of anxiety, uh, and uh, and when you have a home device, there is a risk you're going to test all the time, right? And when you get the, you're you're going to over test, and when you, when you over test, you might uh, look at some anomaly and think that it's something uh, really problematic. Of course, there's less professional treatment for, by from from the physiotherapist, so it's good to mix it up. Um, generally, publications show that, you know, the more you come to the clinic, the better your health is, right? From a macro level, um, without going into details, the people that go more to the clinics, uh, maybe because it's it gives them more compliance and they tell them, hey, you're not treating yourself. Maybe it's because people listen to you and look at you, right? Your picture, you, your, the color of your skin even, it, it creates something better. So obviously this is a risk and it is a less controlled environment. And uh, the, the surveys, to be honest, are, are tedious, even for somebody very compliant as me. 
but look at the red uh, uh, thin line uh, in, in, uh, uh, at the bottom of the page. Since I started home treatment, I went up from 72% FEV1 to 78%, which is a really big jump for me because I was really, really stable. I don't know if it's just that. It could be a lot of other things, right? Uh, but you know, looking at this graph of where I am from 2002 slowly deteriorating and then starting to go up with vertex uh, uh, drugs, but also going additionally up with uh, home treatment, it might be something that actually improved. So I don't have research on that. I don't personally believe or not, but I just wanted to give you the data. And the data looks like for an F N of one and not a, a, a large clinical trial, it looks like it might have some uh, benefit. Um, so so for, for me, self-management still needs to be uh, co-op with your medical center. I, I thought it was funny that the word COPD, co-op, uh, actually found its way here. I uh, hope I'm not uh, too uh, uh, less funny as I thought. Uh, define, I think we need to define anomalies which have to be reported and not everything needs to be reported. Uh, we need to define these the cycles when home is okay and real practice is okay, is needed. Uh, we don't want it to be uh, completely out of control. And, and, and we need to continuously update the process uh, with new tools and new, uh, new changes. Um, the, the last two things is that we really need to start thinking about personalized treatment. What happened along the years with CF is that because we didn't have all these drugs which are specific to genetics, everybody was kind of in the same boat. So everyone were treatment, treated kind of in the same protocol. Uh, so now when you have drugs for, for specific genetics in CF, uh, we, want, we want to see more personalized treatment, but I think home metering will also contribute to something like uh, home, uh, uh, sorry, personalized treatment. We are not there yet, at least not in Israel, uh, uh, but I hope we will be someday uh, because I think it's about time we get uh, 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 a treatment which is specific to uh, a person and not uh, the general protocol. Just one more note about data. Um, and I'll open it up. Uh, we'll open it up later for questions. Anomalies. So, so you know, I think the most important thing is to collect all the data all the time and let some research team to work on uh, trying to see what the significance of anomalies are. For example, heart rate, which is slowly getting down. Maybe it's a, an example that of a prediction that we can know that, hey, you're not there yet. You're not in a bad shape yet, but something's different and maybe you need to look at it. Um, personalized treatment we talked about and surveys. I think I started off very compliant here and I'm a very, uh, uh, I'm a very uh, uh, sophisticated user with a phone. I try to optimize it, but still in the end of the day, they also broke me, you know, in the end of the day, maybe it's not, maybe it's because I don't get any value from it, but the manual surveys, everything you need to do either every night or even every week, in the end of the day, I stopped. I just couldn't really uh, uh, get focused on it. It took me a few good months, but uh, even a very compliant person as me, I, I just couldn't do it uh, in the long run. So that's it for me. Um, should I stop sharing uh, for the Q&A? Uh, yes, you yes, yeah. Thank you so much, Ian, for sharing your personal experience and the insights around self-management. We will now move on to the Q&A, the question and answer session for both Ian and Tanya. And we have a lot of questions, I think, both in our heads and also in the chat. Uh, and uh, so we'll try to answer as many as possible. We have 15 minutes. And if someone would like to ask a question directly, please raise your hand in Zoom. There are some instructions on the screen uh, showing how to do this. Firstly, I will actually ask you, Tanya, uh, what I was thinking of when you did the Q&A. 
that it came out that the healthcare professional, the support, but I think time is also one problem because when you go to see your healthcare professional, some have a lot of time and some have a very tight schedule. And like you said, there are different types of uh, patients uh, and the adherence. Um, I don't know, you may not have the answer to that, but what do you think we can do? So we will get that because it's so important for patients to get the right information, what to do for feeling better from the health professional or provider. Yeah, that, that is really an organizational issue almost from the, um, because I think you see that the medical doctors often have a lack of time um, and they are important in signing off action plans, etc. But um, within COPD self-management, you see often that the nurses have the time to really discuss things and um, to do that shared decision making. And of course, ideally, you would like to have the doctors involved in that. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, what we see in practice is that the nurses do that part and that the doctors uh, sign off. So they know what is happening, but it is the nurses who are, um, for example, um, what we use in a COPD self-management uh, with Ritrocato exacerbate, exacerbation management is that where we have an uh, what is a normal what is normal for me card with Ritrocato symptoms, and that is something uh, the nurse and the patient uh, discuss together, so they have a baseline. So the patient has a baseline. Uh, when he, uh, he or she has to um, complete the diaries after that. So he knows what they have decided is normal for, for them, which got to, uh, I can walk 200 meters without getting breathless, for example. So they can go back to that. And that is something you can't ask from a doctor to do that with the, with the patient. Course. That is something you do with a nurse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. And here, I can just say in Sweden, the association have a COPD school. So they work together with the asthma and COPD nurse uh, helping the patient go. And they have created this school. So they wow. were it's a very yeah. good idea. <laughs> so, and I saw, I'm trying to see all the questions, but it, I will ask Nicole, I saw that you wrote two different questions to Tanya. Uh, do you feel comfortable by asking them yourself? Now we were talking, I, I, I think what I put there is about health literature, how importantly it is, but it was already answered. So I don't think this will be a question. Anything I would like to underline this that we need functionally literacy. I mean, the ability to read simple text and write simple sentences about everyday life. And that seems so obvious, but it is not ob obvious because there is evidence, scientific evidence, that a lot of people don't have this uh, functionally literacy. So we need really this for for our self-management. I think we have to focus a bit more on this. I like this COPD school. That's very nice. I find this very interesting to interact between nurses and doctors, of course, and patients, you know, and may, and even with families. I think this is important as well. So the, a bit more stakeholder engagement. I think this is very important. Yeah, you yeah. said that keyword support. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, can, uh, Gundula? Can I add, yeah, yeah, can I add one, one comment? Because uh, talking about uh, health literacy, that is one thing that is really important. And I think people are really aware of that now. And we are looking for solutions and different resources. But then we also have the digital health literacy with uh, apps, etc., uh, being more and more used. That is really an, an issue at the moment, especially for uh, elderly people. Um, but I also think we are more aware of it and we have to look at solutions. Um, it, it is the first thing is awareness, isn't it? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Anyway, you know, you know, these modern information technology like internet for, for examples, it was proved that uh, a very small percentage of, of population really used the, 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 the internet. And you know, the information on, on internet isn't always trustful. So we talked 
about this, about the trustful information, I, I think this is very, very important as well. And another, another aspect I forgot to mention is this motivational communication with the patient, the, the, healthcare, the healthcare doctor with the patient, and at the same time, this reflective listening. I think this is a big problem as well. You know, we need the right information in order to give the right information. And that's really a question <clears throat> of direction not between healthcare professionals and patients. Thank you, Nicole. I see Gundula, you have your hand up. Uh, Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tanya, for the interesting uh, uh, presentation. Um, I have three points, which are the nurses, the management plan, and the emotional uh, support. Um, I think, I mean, nurses would be fine uh, if we had them everywhere in Europe. In Austria, for example, and in a lot of other European countries, it's not, it's not an implemented issue that we have respiratory nurses. Uh, our general practitioners have about five minutes time to treat a COPD patient in their offices and uh, they are not always uh, capable of going to ambulances, uh, which is uh, in the rural area, especially possible, but not uh, uh, outside. Then the second uh, is, I, I'm grateful that you talked about uh, behavioral behavioral changes which are necessary for a lot of COPD patients, uh, but we leave them alone to learn how to do that. I, I really miss this part in the COPD management plan. Uh, it needs to be implemented and it needs to be part of therapy. Um, yeah, that's about it. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, I think we need to do a lot we have uh, very good doctors, but they don't have time for their patients. Uh, it's always an issue of money also. And uh, it depends on countries if what kind of uh, management plans they have in, um, they have, you know, operation kind of. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, with with Regard to your first comment uh, that uh, doctors only have five minutes time and that there are no nurses available. Um, if you look at um, a very recent uh, review uh, in, uh, in asthma, uh, it's from the gr uh, group of Hillary Pinnock. Um, it's clear from that review that um, a self-management intervention should be iterative and at least have two hours of um, an intervention. So if a medical doctor has only five minutes, um, I don't think you can move towards self-management because you don't have the time to implement it as it should be implemented. Um, I think that's really important to realize. And that's the same in COPD. You can't just hand out an action plan. There is no evidence available that that is um, uh, effective at all, and it can even have the opposite um, uh, effect. Uh, so uh, there needs there needs to be time, and there needs to be an iterative places uh, process in place with with support. Um, otherwise, you can't do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm talking. I'm talking about GPs. You know, I know that uh, pulmonologists would have maybe more time, but two hours. I think this is something uh, the health system at the moment is not willing to pay. And we need to know. No, no but if you, and, uh, unsup there's no evidence that unsupported self management interventions have effects. So then it's almost do you then just, mm -hmm. yeah. you have the things into place to, to yeah. yeah. I yeah. think we can take more questions also. Thank you so much, Kundra. I think this is a question for you, Ian. Uh, uh, how would you suggest patient and professional work out which is the best device for current time and not something that is out of date? Let me see. Uh, I'm not sure which, which question. Can you say? It's, what from, it's, 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 it's from, from Pam. So which is the best device to use? Okay. Some, some people don't use something that is... Okay, so I think that the best, there's a lot of very good and important devices, and I think sleeping, sleep control can, can give you a lot, but I think the best answer 
to, to give an answer for everybody here would actually be the, spir the home spirometer, because I know it's also controversial. I saw a few comments there. So I think I'll give a, the, the, the best answer on that. Uh, so it's important to treat, uh, but I think the main concern for, for CFR when he doesn't go to clinic is that you can lose even a third of your lung function and not even know it, right? The lungs are so big, they're so complex. So it's important, but both very risky to know where you are in regards to the, your uh, spirometry. However, and I think it's a good comment that I saw in one of the chat, home spirometers could be very inaccurate. They're actually very good ones now. I always look at the kind of a, the differences between the, uh, uh, the ones in the hospital and the one that I have in home. There is some kind of delta. I think that's relevant in general in CF. Never look at absolute numbers only look at the trend. And that's relevant to spirometry and it's relevant to everything you do in, in chronic, uh, uh, in chronic uh, uh, diseases. Look at it as an indication, as something that if it's a bad metric, test it again, test it a day later, there are good days, there are bad days. And, and for me, I always say, don't abuse it. Don't overtest it because that was the first thing I wanted to do to, to check out how it is after food, before food, after certain <laughs> food, after swimming, after jumping, after everything. Uh, so I'm proud of myself for not doing it. I think it's good enough to do once so every two weeks, even unless you feel bad and wait a few days and then test it. I think that is a very good comment because, like you said, if it's overused and you get a bad result, you will maybe feel very, very anxious that something is wrong. So this is, again, support where it comes in, how important it is so you know how to use them. Because a patient who feels confident in its disease will not go to the and have a self-management plan, so know, so know what to do when something happens, will not go to the hospital as often as one who is not confident. So I think it's great to help, but you need that support exactly. Uh, we'll see there are more. Um, Sarah kind of says, very interesting insight, Ian. Do you have a reference to the idea that you just lose up to the third of the lung function or not even know it? It's a great insight on poor uh, perceivers. Oh, you're, you're on mute, Ian. You're on mute. Sorry. So no, I don't have any specific reference, but you know, look at the bigger numbers. Uh, like, let's say you start off at around 100%. Uh, my specific experience, when, you, when you're not asthmatic, right? When you're talking about something more chronic, is that you kind of feel the same even when doing sports. Sports is a very objective thing, right? You swim and you see if you're slower or not. And I got the same numbers when I was in 100 and in, a, in 70. And, and, and when, I, when I understood that, I, remem I rem remember what my first doctor told me. And he told me exactly that. You can lose around a third and you won't even notice it. Actually, when you go under 50, you start feeling it, right? It's hard to go up the stairs and your spirometer, uh, sorry, your SP02 goes down. But before that, you can have 98% uh, uh, saturation. Uh, so yes, you have to monitor everything uh, all the time. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for all your questions. I think we, I will hand over now to Jen. Yeah, so I'm, I'm eager, Michaela. So thank you also for all the questions and for great uh, speeches or great talks. So I just wanted to uh, to touch upon the last uh, single issue because I think, Tanya, you also mentioned something like shared decision making. So I wonder both for Elon and uh, for, for Tanya, have you practiced shared decision making? Elon, you are obviously very proficient with data but does it translate into your doctoral uh, or to the practice uh, that you consult? I, I think it's not a great example because this whole practice of mole metering after COVID, it's, a, it's an actual project 
in our so they took the doctor, which is, I'll say, more flexible to run this project. And we communicate all the time about what's good and what's bad. Uh, but let's say it wasn't like that. I would imagine there was a lot of tension and a lot of uh, arguments about is this true or not. And in the end of the day, the doctor will say, you know what, you need to come in. Uh, because he's, he, the doctor will, in the end, I think, will waste a lot of time on this subjective comments and all the rough data. And, and it will be kind of a, a trial all the time. So it hasn't stood the real, uh, real life scenario yet, but I would imagine it depends on the doctor, but in the end, even the more patient one would probably say, yeah, you should come in because we're not, we're not making a lot of progress. That's why you need real metrics all the time. You need something they can trust. Fantastic, thank you so much. Tanya, do you have any great examples of shared decision making in this self management process? Um, no, because um, not yet, because the interventions we um, uh, use at the moment are often completely set. So the components are set and it's not um, this is what you get or and it's all it's really hard to tailor. So I think it's some something we are moving towards. So we have, for example, different components, and then you go into that discussion. So it is m more and more, more I have to say, um, it is probably something for the future to have it really in, um, in practice, because uh, doctors have to be really flexible if they want to use shared decision making. And we have to, at the moment, they have something in mind and they try to get the patient on that path. And it's almost a yes or a no. And the ideal uh, situation should be that they have a box with all kinds of things and they discuss together what they are going to use and what they don't, uh, uh, what they are not going to use. But again, I think this is something between the nurse and the patient and uh, the doctor will sign off on it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, both for really inspiring speeches. And now we have both great examples and great insights, but we also have discussions for the future, which is also very valuable. And thank you all for your questions and for your engagement in this part. Uh, I think this has been really great. And I'm, I'm really sensing that there's a lot of enthusiasm about this issue. So maybe also something we'll continue to, uh, to discuss. Now for something a bit different and something I've been teasing about in the newsletter. It is a great pleasure to uh, be able to introduce Marianne Riley. And Marianne uh, will, is a laughter yoga instructor from Ireland. And she's going to lead us through a few exercises. And this is something uh, I look forward to at least. So you might know your own or you, you will know your own health best, of course. So please participate according to your own pace and you are free to stop, of course, at any time of the session. It may be helpful to have some water close to you. And if you're comfortable, then you could also uh, turn on your video camera so we can see what everyone is doing in this exercise. But most importantly is to have fun and to enjoy yourself. And with that, I want to hand over to Marion. Welcome, Marion. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Oh, brilliant. I'm very new to Zoom. So forgive me if I'm if I make a few blunders, but we just laugh about it. Okay, if that's the case. Now I think I should be um yeah. You can all hear me and see me. Brilliant. Okay. Marion is my name, Marion Riley. I live in Dublin, Ireland, and I'm just so delighted to be here this morning giving a laugh for yoga um, session. And I all your talks previous have been just so um it's just been very informative because I don't know much about um the organization. But I'm not going to talk. Uh, I'm going to just start very briefly. I'm just going to give a very brief about what laughter yoga is. Then I'd like you all to join me in a few warm ups, then um, a few fun exercises 
and then we'll finish with a very gentle meditation. Okay, so laughter yoga is great fun to start with, and it's childlike playfulness and some yoga breathing and some fun exercise. And we laugh just like when we were children. We laugh from our bodies, not from our minds. And the body, the good news is that the body doesn't know the difference between real and fake laughter. We get the same health benefits. And that old saying, laughter is the best medicine, is so true. There's many benefits to be got from laughing. Um, to name but a few, it helps you sleep better. It's brilliant for anxiety, depression, low self-esteem. Um, it, it gives your whole body a little mini workout. And the best thing with the laughter yoga, which I love, is you cannot make a mistake. And in the event of you thinking you make a mistake, you just laugh about it. Okay, so I've done enough talking. Just um, enjoy it. Have some water to hand. Stop if you need to. The most important element is do it at your own pace and enjoy it. So I'm just going to start now and I hope you all can see me. In laughter yoga, we have a special clap. And so we just, I'd like you all to join me in this special clap, palm to palm, finger to finger. So we just go clapping. Yeah. Brilliant. Now, as well as clapping, we go one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. Brilliant. How is everybody doing? It's very different doing uh, laughter yoga on Zoom instead of a group in the, in the room. So are we all okay? Brilliant. Okay. So can you remember a time when you were just, everything was just going fantastic and you just had to let it all out and you went, very good, very good, yay. So I'd like you to join me again with practicing this very good. Very good, very good. Yay! Brilliant. How are we doing? Are we doing okay? Are we all joining in all over the world? Yes? Brilliant. Okay. So we're going to do the little ho ho again, but instead of saying one, two, one, two, three, we go ho, ho, ha, 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 ho, ho. do it at your own pace if you're only able to reach that far that's fine it, the most important thing is to enjoy it in laughter yoga we do the next bit we do is where we pretend it's laughter yoga is all like it's all about being childlike and pretending and having some fun so we pretend that we're going to make a milkshake and when we have it mixed enough we throw it back and we just laugh. Now, you may feel a bit silly to start with, but uh, we're all being silly here this morning. So we just fake it till we make it. Okay, so we're going to try this one, the milkshake. We do a strawberry milkshake this morning. After this, we need a milkshake, a strawberry one. So we're going to go e e e Two more, I think it's mixed enough. E, e and one more. E, e and we throw it back and we just laugh. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Oh. Oh. Ha, 
Very good. Very good. Yay! Brilliant. So now we're just going to just let our shoulders drop. Okay. And we just breathe in through our nose. Out through our mouth. Breathe in through our nose again. Again, doing it at your own pace. And one more. We'll just give our shoulders a, a roll. One, two, three. And one, two, three. Brilliant. So we just shake it all out. Equipment. And now the next one we do is where we just pretend that we're out, we're getting a call from our friend across uh, Australia or wherever. We haven't seen this friend for many years. And we're just chatting away. Oh, yeah, really? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Seriously. Yes. And then our friend at the other end of the line makes us laugh and we cannot. Stop laughing. Ah! 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 Ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Very good. Very good. Yay. So how are we doing on time? Have I got much, have I, I haven't got much time. You're We're, okay. You've got a few minutes still, Marion. Have I got a few minutes left? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, as I said, I, um, we start off with the, with the warm up, the exercise, the fun exercise, and we're going to finish now with a meditation. Now, this is a very small um, insight into laughter yoga. We generally, we'd be half an hour, an hour at least. So now what I'm going to invite you to do is I'm going to invite you to just totally relax. Drop your shoulders. Close your eyes if you're comfortable. And just imagine you have reached this beautiful, beautiful beach. Laughter yoga is all about imagination. And just bringing your mind to wherever brings you happiness. And we all need that from time to time. So I'm just going to bring you to that, this beautiful beach. And we're just totally relaxing. And we have our special rainbow towel with us. And this special rainbow towel gives off healing rays. So we're totally relaxed. You're totally peaceful, totally calm. And we've had our sun lotions on. We've put our sun lotion on. And we're totally relaxed. We hear the ocean waves going back and forth, back and forth. And we hear the children in the distance, building sand castles and knocking them down just for the fun of it. And we hear the birds singing in the distance. We 
we're totally joyful, totally peaceful, and we're totally calm. I'm just going to recite a little poem to you, and it's called Smile. Smiling is contagious, you catch it like the chicken pox. When someone smiled at me today, I started smiling too. I passed around the corner and someone saw my grin. When he smiled, I realized I passed it on to him. So if you feel a smile begin, please do not leave it undetected. Let's get the world smiling and make the world a happier place. So I'm going to give you, let you finish with a very good, and I wish you all a brilliant day. And I found the so far so interesting and so informative. So we're going to get, we're all going to finish with a very good, uh, very good. Clap on the back to everybody. Brilliant. Everybody give themselves a good clap on the back. And now we're going to go very good. Very good. Yay. So thanks a million. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And so that was a lot of fun. And I'm tempted to say very good, but in fact, it was brilliant, <laughs> right? So, so thank you so much. And I see a lot of positive feedback also in the, in the chat. So we'll now, I think, deserve the, a 10 minute break.